Thank you for the kind introduction and invitation to speak here today. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm excited by the opportunity to share some new scientific insights from the metabolome in the UK Biobank. In my talk today, I will first tell you what these metabolic biomarkers are and how they can enrich the UK Biobank collection of data. I will then show some examples on how these biomarkers can be used to improve risk prediction for various types of diseases. And I will round off my talk by telling how we are translating these scientific findings into individual consumer products. Predicting the onset of chronic diseases can be challenging, and oftentimes they are detected when it's too late and the patient has already developed the disease. New biomarker omics technologies hold promise to improve this, but the occurrence of the evidence at large scale has long been missing. These metabolic biomarker profiling tools developed by Nightingale Health have been shown to be able to identify individuals at the highest risk of developing chronic diseases such as heart disease and diabetes years in advance, which would enable to extend the time available for prevention and extend the healthy life of these patients. For a long time, we thought that this could be applied only for traditional lifestyle-related diseases like heart disease and diabetes, but today I will show that this can be actually true for many other diseases as well. Many of the results that I will show today have already been translated to individual consumer use in Scandinavia, but in my talk today, I will focus on the science behind. Nightingale Health is a Finnish company that has developed this metabolic blood biomarker profiling platform that has been widely used to screen cohorts, biobanks and trials, and it has already resulted in more than 350 scientific publications. This technology is based on nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR in short, and it allows one to quantify a comprehensive metabolic profile from a single blood sample in one go. The panel measures highly abundant circulating biomarkers in the bloodstream from diverse metabolic pathways. These biomarkers include routinely used clinical measures like triglycerides, cholesterols, and glucose, but there are also many other more emerging biomarkers like fatty acids reflecting dietary intake, small molecules like amino acids, inflammatory biomarkers, glycolysis and catalysis related biomarkers, and many more. The platform quantifies 250 biomarkers in total, but what is particularly worth emphasizing is that 37 of these biomarkers have been approved for clinical use in Europe and CE mark, meaning that the measurements are of clinical grade and can be, for instance, used to follow up the individuals over time, which makes the translation of part easier. In 2018, Nightingale announced that it would profile the entire Europe, UK Biobank collections of half a million samples as the first plot biomarker omics assay. And I think we're living quite exciting times today. The first batch of the data was released to the research community last year, and there's more data coming in, the, in next year. What is particularly exciting is that this is the largest metabolomic screening initiative ever carried out, with sample size of magnitudes larger than some of the existing metabolic studies carried out today. And we believe that this data, together with the vast amount of other available data types in UK Biobank, will generate many new, exciting scientific insights. And in my talk today, I will mainly focus on risk prediction, but there are also many other applications that this data can be used for. As one of the first analyses, we ran this FIVAS type of association scan of all the biomarkers across all available disease endpoints in UK Biobank. So we did this by linking the blood biomarker data with the electronic health records available in UK Biobank to see how each of these individual biomarkers would associate with the future incidence of diseases during 10-year follow-up. In this figure, I show the 37 clinically validated biomarkers on the x-axis, and then the y-axis shows the number of diseases each biomarker was found to be significantly associated with. And the color coding represents the ICD chapters that each of these diseases are coming from. So what was particularly astonishing to see was that these biomarkers associated with such a wide range of diseases and not just traditional cardiometabolic diseases like heart disease and diabetes, but there are also many diseases coming from, for instance, digestive system, respiratory system, and infectious diseases that these biomarkers were found to be associated with. In my talk today, I will not go into details of these individual biomarker associations, 
But we have actually yesterday published a preprint together with this at Atlas tool, uh, which is a web-based tool where you can explore the associations of all of these individual biomarkers against all the available disease endpoints in the UK Biobank. The tool allows you to make different kinds of visualizations. There are summary statistics available for download. So if you have a favorite biomarker or a favorite disease, you can go and look the tool up and see how your favorite biomarker relates to different diseases. And this is available on the Nightingale website. I will also put the link at the end of my presentation. Many metabolic biomarkers are already routinely used in clinics. The key difference is that traditional clinical chemistry looks at these biomarkers individually or in small groups. For instance, if the doctor is interested in your heart disease risk, they might order a cholesterol test, or if they're interested in your type 2 diabetes risk, they might order a glucose or HbA1c test. But the key advantage in Nightingale's NMR-based panel is that you can capture dozens of biomarkers from different metabolic pathways in a single go. And many of the biomarkers measured by this NMR platform are the same as used in routine clinical chemistry, but it also includes many other more emerging biomarkers. Getting all these measurements from a single test allows one to combine the information available from all of these metabolic pathways to get a more comprehensive view of the health. So if you're, for instance, interested in heart disease, you don't only need to look at the cholesterol measures, but you can also integrate information from fatty acid or triglyceride metabolism. How do we then combine information from these dozens of biomarkers? I will here show an example of building this prediction model, what we call biomarker risk scores for heart health, but the same procedure can really be applied for any other disease as well. So as the first step, we now have these biomarkers measured from 100,000 individuals who donated their blood sample to UK Biobank 10 years ago. And these individuals were healthy at baseline. <coughs> then from the electronic health records, we know who of these 100,000 individuals developed heart attack during the 10-year follow-up. Then finally, we now have large enough sample size that we can divide this into a training set and test set. And then we can use machine learning in the training set to derive a biomarker risk score that reflects one risk of developing heart disease in the next 10 years. And then we can use the independent test set to evaluate how this biomarker score performs. And the idea for this biomarker risk scores is very similar to polygenic risk scores. But instead of summarizing the effect of multiple genetic variants on individuals' disease risk, here we summarize the effect coming from multiple different biomarkers. One of the first application areas where we studied this biomarker risk scores were infectious diseases. With the COVID pandemic going on during the past years, it was very timely to try to see if we could somehow identify those most fragile individuals at the highest risk of developing a severe form of an infectious disease. We started studying infectious diseases by looking at pneumonia. And pneumonia is this common complication of respiratory infections where the air sacs of the lungs get inflamed. And it is also the most common complications in patients with severe form of COVID-19. And here we focused in severe pneumonia in particular, where the diagnosis was coming from hospital or death records. Here you can first see the associations of the 37 individual biomarkers with the risk of severe pneumonia. So the forest plot shows how one standard deviation unit increment in each of these biomarkers corresponds to severe pneumonia risk. We discovered many individual biomarker associations. So for instance, inflammatory biomarkers like glycoprotein acetyls or albumin were found to be significantly associated with the risk of severe pneumonia. But there were also many other more novel biomarkers associated with the risk of severe pneumonia. So for instance, aberrations in the concentrations of many fatty acids and decreased concentrations of many amino acids were found to be predictive of severe pneumonia. But what was particularly interesting was that this biomarker score that aggregates information coming from all of these individual biomarkers was actually twice a strong predictor than any of these individual biomarkers. So this proved that instead of looking at these individual biomarkers, it would actually make sense to combine information from all of them to get much more powerful prediction. To further explore how this biomarker risk score would perform in stratifying the risk for severe pneumonia. Here we saw the portion of population who developed severe pneumonia by percentiles of the biomarker risk score. 
So each dot in the plot corresponds to one percentile of the biomarker score, which means roughly 500 individuals in the test set. And you can see that as you move to higher levels of the biomarker risk score, you observe significantly increased risk of severe pneumonia. And what is particularly worth emphasizing is this hockey stick shaped tail effect, where individuals in the top 10 or 20% are at significantly higher risk than the rest of the population. So this means that if you are in the tail of the multi-biomarker risk score, you are at significantly higher risk of getting severe pneumonia than the rest of the population. Here is the same information presented in a slightly different way. So here we saw the risk trajectories as a function of follow-up. So starting from the plot sampling and then following up the individuals over 10 years. And again, then the y-axis shows the cumulative incidence of severe pneumonia in the top decile of the biomarker risk score and then the remaining population. So you can see that in the highest decile, almost 10% of people develop severe pneumonia, so every 10th person, whereas in the remaining population, it was less than 2.5%. So this means that if you are in the highest decile of the biomarker risk score, your risk of getting severe pneumonia leading to hospitalization or death is five times higher compared to the rest of the population. So again, this single score that combines information from all of these circulating biomarkers can identify individuals on very different risk trajectories. With the COVID pandemic going on, we naturally wanted to investigate if the same biomarker risk score would also be predictive of severe COVID. And here, severe COVID was defined as positive diagnosis coming from an hospitalized individual or death from COVID. So again, these forest plots show how one unit standard deviation increment in the biomarker risk score corresponds to risk of severe pneumonia on top and then severe COVID in the bottom. So for pneumonia, we observed 1.6-fold risk increase, whereas for severe COVID, it was 1.4-fold. So the association magnitude is slightly attenuated for COVID. But what is particularly important to note is that the COVID pandemic occurred a decade after the plot samples were taken, meaning that the plot samples taken 10 years ago could already back then predict who was at the highest risk of getting severe COVID in 2019. We also investigated the effect of the time lag on the associations more in that related paper and indeed came to the conclusion that likely the associated magnitude is attenuated indeed by the, by the time lag. After seeing these promising results for the infectious diseases, we naturally wanted to explore if these biomarker risk scores could be applied for other diseases as well. And after having seen that these individual biomarkers associate with such a wide range of diseases, it would make sense to try to combine them to get even more powerful predictions. Here I show eight examples of diseases for which we developed this multi-biomarker risk scores. So again, the plot show how the risk increases by percentiles of the biomarker risk score. And you can see again that once you move to higher levels of the biomarker risk score, you observe significantly increased risk of various types of diseases. So it's not just cardiometabolic <coughs> diseases like diabetes or heart disease, but there are also many other diseases like chronic respiratory diseases, COPD, or liver fibrosis and cirrhosis, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, and even mental health outcomes like depression, for which we identified these significant risk gradients. Again, and again, there is this kind of tail effect, where individuals in the top 10 or 20 percent are at significantly higher risk than the rest of the population. And often, the magnitude of the risk gradient for these more novel disease areas is compar comparable to that of, uh, say, type 2 diabetes or myocardial infarction. So again, this biomarker risk score that aggregates information from all of these biomarkers can actually be a very powerful predictor of many different types of diseases. And all of these results are adjusted for age and sex, so they represent the effect only coming from the biomarkers. And again, the same information presented in a slightly different way and showing the risk trajectories as a function of follow-up. So again, as we earlier saw with the infectious diseases, people in the top decile of the biomarker risk score are at significantly higher risk than the rest of the population. So for instance, uh, for type 2 diabetes, there's almost 25% in the people in the top decile who develop diabetes. So every fourth individual in this dark blue curve developed diabetes. Whereas in the rest of the population, it's around 
So this means that people in the highest decile are at 12 fold higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes than the rest of the population. And there are also many other equally impressive examples like liver fibrosis and cirrhosis or chronic kidney disease where the risk fold is also around 12 fold. Then there are also other examples like depression where the risk increase is not as impressive but still meaningful. So for instance for depression, people in the highest decile of the biomarker score, there's 8% of people who develop depression, whereas in the remaining population it's around 3%. So the fault risk increase is around two, threefold. So it is still significant. So this again proves that this single score can identify individuals on very different risk trajectories for developing different types of diseases. Given the idea that the idea for the biomarker risk scores was very similar to polygenic risk scores, we also wanted to investigate how these biomarker risk scores would perform in relation to polygenic risk scores. So here I show these ROC curves. So essentially the closer the curve pens to the top left corner, the better job the score or the model does in classifying the individuals to those who will develop and who will not develop the disease. So you can see again here for different types of diseases. First there is this baseline model consisting of eight and six. Once you then add polygenic risk score to the baseline model, you observe improved prediction accuracy. But these biomarker risk scores were often significantly better predictors of the onset of these diseases than the polygenic risk scores. But what I think is particularly interesting that these two risk scores provide complementary views on one's health. So whereas this polygenic risk score is a static, fixed representation of your risk that is present since you were born, these biomarkers reflect the lifestyle choices you make and how they affect your biomarkers and what is going on in your body at the moment. And often if you combine these two, you get even better <coughs> predictions. For the final part of my talk, I wanted to briefly explain how we are translating these scientific findings into individual consumer use. For nearly all common diseases, whether it's heart disease, diabetes or depression, the information to guide to prevent these diseases is currently hidden from many individuals and healthcare systems around the world. And Nightingale is a company on a mission to power individuals with their own health information to enable them to make informed actions today to live lifelong health. In this spring, we launched this app called Livit, which is largely based on the science that I just showed you. And it is based on a fingerprint plot sample that the um, customer sent to us and then we measure the metabolic biomarkers. And this app provides a prediction of your healthy years, which is the estimated age under which you are expected to live before falling ill from a disease that will significantly reduce the quality of your life. And in addition, this app provides a comprehensive picture of the well-being of your heart, mind, immunity and metabolism. So using this app, you can essentially find out where you fall on that biomarker risk curve. And on a final note, despite my presentation today mainly focusing on risk prediction, I wanted to emphasize that there really are endless opportunities to use the UK Biobank data. So whether you're interested in biomarker discovery or understanding disease mechanism on a molecular level, to combining the data with the genetic data available to inform on causality or drug development, there really are vast amount of opportunities. And UK Biobank is really just the beginning. Profiling other studies like patient cohorts and clinical trials is likely to generate even more opportunities. Thank you for your attention. I will put the link to this biomarker disease atlas there, so if you want to go and, go and explore. Now I'm happy to take any questions.